Prior to Charles Darwin, scientists had some rather strange ideas concerning how life began. They believed that living organisms came into being rapidly and spontaneously over a period of just a few weeks. The scientific community believed in spontaneous generation for 2,000 years. And it is a stark reminder that even a majority of scientists can be wrong. In his classic 17th century description of spontaneous generation, scientist Jan Baptist von Helmont suggested that mice came from dirty underwear. Wanneer je een stuk gedragen ondergoed, if you put a piece of sweaty underwear in an open mouth jar, together with a piece of wheat, after 21 days the ferment coming out of the underwear changed the wheat into mice. But what is even more amazing is that the mice are not small or aborted mice, but adult mice emerge. Another evidence offered for spontaneous generation was the rotting meat experiment. 17th century scientists observed that if meat was placed in an open jar, maggots formed on the meat weeks later. They conjectured that life, in the form of maggots, arose spontaneously from rotting meat. But in 1668, Francesco Redi, an Italian physician and scientist, overturned this idea. He suggested this proof of spontaneous generation was nothing more than contamination of the meat by flies. When flies landed on the rotting meat, they laid their eggs. Over time, these eggs grew into maggots. Later, the maggots changed into flies. When scientist Reddy prevented flies from landing on the meat with a piece of cheesecloth, maggots never formed. A third evidence for spontaneous generation was the 19th century pond water experiment. Scientists took pond water, boiled it, and poured it into an open jar. After a few weeks, the sterilized water was now teeming with bacteria. Soon the water became cloudy. Scientists suggested this was proof of spontaneous generation. The bacteria arose spontaneously from the sterile water. They scoffed at anyone who dared to question their conclusions. In 1859, Spontaneous generation was finally rejected after the French Academy of Sciences held a contest to see if anyone could definitively prove or disprove the theory. Scientist Louis Pasteur stepped forward. Pasteur theorized that cloudy water did not represent spontaneous generation, rather contamination. He suggested that bacteria in the air seeded the water in the jar. To prove this, he sterilized water in an S-shaped glass. The opened end of the glass pointed upward and allowed air in, but bacteria could only settle in the neck and were prevented from reaching the water. After months of waiting, the liquid in the flask never became cloudy. With this experiment, Pasteur disproved spontaneous generation once and for all, and this first scientific natural explanation for the origin of life collapsed. Today, we can learn from the failures of the past. A scientific idea, theory or law may be believed for thousands of years by a majority of scientists, only to be proven wrong. All scientific theories and laws should be open to scrutiny, even the theory of evolution. The first icon of evolution I wrote about was the Miller-Urey experiment from 1953. Darwin himself actually didn't talk much about the origin of life. His theory began with the first living cell and went from there on. But uh, he hinted, Darwin that is, hinted at the origin of life in some what he called one little pond. In the 1930s, uh, various people came up with an idea that life began on the early Earth when lightning created organic molecules in the atmosphere, which then dissolved in the ocean to form what they called a primordial soup. Well, this was all hypothetical until Stanley Miller in 1953 uh, performed an experiment in which he put in a glass apparatus a mixture of gases that he and others thought represented the early Earth's atmosphere. And then he shot an electric spark through that 
and collected the products in water at the bottom of the apparatus. And after about a week, he was able to detect two of the simplest amino acids, which are the building blocks of proteins. Uh, when I wrote Icons of Evolution in 2000, uh, many biology textbooks had images of the Miller-Urey experiment because although Darwinian evolution doesn't start till after the origin of life, uh, there was this grand evolutionary story that the textbooks wanted to tell, and the Miller-Urey experiment was part of that story. There are many problems with the Miller-Urey experiment. He used a mixture of gases, uh, methane, ammonia, water vapor and hydrogen in his apparatus that many scientists at the time thought represented the early Earth's atmosphere. But uh, by a decade later, most geoscientists or many geoscientists uh, were convinced that the early atmosphere was not like that at all. First of all, uh, it seems there was probably some oxygen present. Well, if you had put oxygen in the Miller-Urey apparatus, with hydrogen and then shot a spark through it, the thing would have blown up. So oxygen had to be excluded. Uh, and yet it appears now that probably there was some oxygen in the early atmosphere. The uh, early atmosphere apparently was not rich in hydrogen. Most geoscientists now think the early atmosphere consisted of the same gases that come out of volcanoes in the modern world. And those gases are water vapor, carbon dioxide, and nitrogen. Well, if you put those gases into the Miller-Urey apparatus and shoot a spark through them, you don't get any amino acids at all. You have to have some free hydrogen present. So when you put a realistic mixture of gases in the Miller-Urey apparatus, you don't get anything like the building blocks of life. And so the experiment appears now to be irrelevant to the origin of life. But there's an even more serious problem. Even if someone could show, and every now and then someone publishes a paper claiming to show, that certain basic building blocks of life could form under pre-life conditions without any sort of intelligent design or intervention, even if we could show that, we would still be uh, immeasurably far from creating a living cell. And here's how we know that. I take a sterile test tube and I put in a little bit of fluid with just the right salts, just the right balance of acidity and alkalinity, just the right temperature, the perfect solution for a living cell. And I put in it one living cell. This cell is alive. It has everything it needs for life. Now I take a sterile needle and I poke that cell and all its stuff leaks out into this test tube. You have in this nice little test tube all the molecules you need for a living cell. Not just the pieces of the molecules, but the molecules themselves. And you cannot make a living cell out of them. You can't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. So what makes you think that a few amino acids dissolved in the ocean are going to give you a living cell? It's totally unrealistic. Stanley Miller's experiment was not the only unsuccessful attempt to explain how life originated. Beginning with Russian chemist Alexander Oparin's work in the 1920s, theorists have also proposed chance, chemical attraction, and biological seeding from outer space as possible answers. Each has failed to account for how non-living chemicals could have arranged themselves into the most basic components of the first living cell. Miller intervened in the experiment through various conscious mechanisms such as the cold trap by way of which he was able to isolate the amino acids that formed before they could be broken down again. Were it not for equipment such as the cold trap, a source of sparks and other chemicals that emerged during the course of the experiment, the amino acids that appeared would have immediately broken down again. In this way, Miller himself destroyed the evolutionist hypotheses regarding amino acids being able to form spontaneously under natural conditions, because there was no such controlled mechanism as evolutionists claim.
in the primordial world capable of separating amino acids that might form before they were broken down. In conclusion, far from documenting that life could emerge spontaneously in nature, all these efforts actually showed that it could not even be produced under laboratory conditions. In the light of these findings, in the 1980s, the scientific world admitted that the Miller experiment and the primordial atmosphere experiments of those who came after him were actually meaningless. After a long silence, Miller himself confessed that the experiment he conducted in 1953 was a far cry from accounting for the origin of life. The evolutionist and scientist Harold Urey who performed the experiment in question together with Miller, made the following admission. All of us who study the origin of life find that the more we look into it, the more we feel it is too complex to have evolved anywhere. We all believe as an article of faith that life evolved from dead matter on this planet. It is just that its complexity is so great, it is hard for us to imagine that it did. A fairy tale, pure and simple. Life from non-life, apart from God's direct intervention, is a fairy tale. But despite that obvious truth, evolutionists continue to build their supposedly scientific case on a foundation that virtually rules out everything that follows after it. Evolution teaches that energy, such as lightning or heat, plus matter, can occasionally create new life. Yet our entire food industry rests on the fact that this can never happen. If we examine a jar of peanut butter, it contains matter and is exposed to light and heat. But we never find new life inside unless an outside life contaminates it. If the theory of evolution was viable, then I should, occasionally, by subjecting this to energy, end up having new life. Now we go down to the store and um, if, if I open this jar of peanut butter, maybe not often, but on some occasion, I should find new life inside. And so, when we open the jar of peanut butter, we look in there, there's no new life. And, I, and, and aren't you glad, okay? Now, um, you may smile at this, but hopefully you'll never forget it because you and I conduct, uh, collectively, over a billion experiments every year, and we've done that for virtually a hundred years, and we never encounter new life. In fact, the entire food industry of the world depends on the fact that evolution doesn't happen.